Well, hello everybody. Welcome to Organ Technology Part 18. Now, it's been a little while since I've done one of these videos, and I'd like to tell you why. Um, several weeks ago, I had the opportunity to borrow a brand new instrument from the Mixture Company, and they build Hopvrick organs. And let me throw up a little still shot of that instrument. So this is on loan to me so I can evaluate it and do some videos and reviews about it here on my channel. Uh, it's a really fun instrument using the Hopvrick software um, and those are a series of videos that I'm sure you're going to want to check out because it's another end of the organ technology world where we'll be checking out uh, digital sample playback systems which are very common in the digital organ world. and. Uh, it's really a, a wonderful thing for me, an opportunity to check out a, a brand new instrument and get to really evaluate it. Uh, Hopwork is very popular. Uh, most people will uh, take an old organ console and convert it to MIDI and then get a computer and load the software. Hopwork allows you to virtually play organs from all over the world. People go out and take samples of these various instruments goes into the Hopwork software and all of that and, and, and it's really a lot of fun to play because I can play uh, British music on a British organ and French music on a French organ and then that is kind of a kick to do. Now speaking of Hopwork, uh, before we get started on today's project on the Rogers 33E, uh, I wanted to respond to a comment I got on an earlier uh, organ technology video where we were looking at the 33E. And of course, you know, this was designed in 1965. It is almost as old as me. And uh, this is ancient technology that is way out of fashion and nobody builds anything like this. And the comment was basically, what on earth are you doing this for? It would be a lot easier to just gut this old organ, convert it to MIDI, and run Hopper. And, uh, yeah, maybe um, that would be the case. Um, but, you know, you could apply the same logic, to, with all due respect, to why would anybody fix up an old airplane? Uh, a new airplane is going to have the latest and greatest equipment on it. It is going to be much easier to deal with. Well, most people look at an old airplane and they say, well, you know, that's a piece of history and, and we want to restore that. Same thing with classic cars. You know, a part of doing this kind of thing is, you know, people who like to tinker. Myself. I, I love tinkering and I'm making these videos for other people who either enjoy tinkering themselves or watching people tinker. Um, plus, we get to learn about stuff from the past, and yeah, this isn't done anymore for good reason. Um, would it be easier to just convert this to Hopwerk and be done with it? Well, you know, that's probably actually going to happen at some point. But here's the thing. I have a deep affection for these old instruments from the 60s and 70s. When I first got interested in the organ, it was in 1977. I saw my first Rogers Theater organ, which used technology that was only slightly more advanced than this. And was, you know, does it sound like a pipe organ? No. Uh, was it as close to a pipe organ as you could get at the time? Yeah. Well, these days, of course, digital technology, whether it be sample playback, additive synthesis, or physical modeling, bring us much closer to imitating a pipe organ. Is it exactly like a pipe organ? Well, it's close, but it's still not the same thing as playing a pipe organ. Um, yeah, if your goal is to have the most realistic sounding organ in your home, then and, and that's all you really care about, then by all means, yes, go straight to converting this thing to Hopwerk or buy a brand new digital instrument from a manufacturer that builds the kind of organ you want. Uh, but some of us like to fiddle with old things just because it's fun, it's amusing to see what we can do with it. Um, I, I liken this to hot rodding. 
Uh, some people like to take old cars and instead of restoring them to their original condition, turn them into something they weren't. And uh, I've messed around now with 26 different organs. I have always made some kind of crazy modification just because let's see what will happen if we do this. And so this is my version of hot rodding, fiddling with old organs. So I think it's fun. A lot of people find it amusing to watch me do it. And other people out there are, are doing similar things as well. Uh, speaking of, uh, one of my supporters over on my Patreon page uh, sent me a little note after the last uh, technology video and uh, I was talking about some of the things I was going to do on this and uh, he said, you know, I've set up my Rogers 340 so that I can play the original percussions, uh, new digital percussions, and even real percussions. At any rate, let's get into uh, today's uh, project here on this, this old 33E. And uh, let me bring the camera in because what I'm doing today is very similar to a previous project, so we'll kind of review what I did with that. So let me get the camera in closer so we can take a look at that. So one of my previous projects is uh, this little red wire right here. And well, what was I doing with that? Okay, so what we're looking at, and you can look at the earlier videos where I talked about uh, how this circuitry works. This is the filter boards for the main tone generator and what happens is there's a bank of oscillators and they are routed to these various filter circuits to create different voices so we have you know post horn, tuba, canura, bombard, clarinet, box humana, strings, etc. Now there's three string stops on the 33E there's from the main generator a viola de orchestra and a solitional and then from a separate generator a celeste and in its original configuration all three were routed to the left main channel and I and a lot of other people who have messed with older Rogers instruments thought the instrument would sound a little better if we split up the strings now at Pete's and Pipes where I first got introduced to the theater organ um, there were string ranks in both chambers on both sides and you could you know mix and match in a variety of ways with the stops on the console so uh, I thought it might be fun to do a little of that as well so what I wanted to do here was get the solitional over to the right channel and put the celeste on both channels so how do we do that now on the filter circuits you have this is the solitional filter over on this end and it ends up here with this resistor and this resistor plugs in at this point to the bus the audio bus that leads over to the left hand or main channel on the audio output board uh, panel so by disconnecting that resistor from the the bus and tying this red wire on here I could run that over here and here's a stop the post horn that is attached to the right or, or a solo channel so I just simply ran this wire over and tacked to the output side of that resistor and voila I had the solitional over on the right hand side now for the celeste rank I wanted that to go to both sides so what I did was I took two resistors and made a Y circuit. One of them was connected to the bus as normal and then the other one was connected to my new bus jumper wire. And so the signal now goes to that main bus and to the solo bus. So when you turn on the Celeste stop it comes out of both uh, sides of the audio. Solitional is on the right, video is on the left and yeah it gives an, a warmer sound to the organ overall uh, now let's take a look at today's project now today's project deals with rerouting the trap and the piano circuit so the percussion instruments on the 33E are generated in a couple of different ways 
the traps, snare drum, bass drum, cymbal, tambourine, that kind of thing, is generated by independent tone generator and filter circuits. They have their own oscillators and everything, and those are right in here. Uh, this is actually the Celeste oscillators. So we have all of our trap circuits. From the main generator, which is on this other panel, we have the piano circuit, and it has a special percussion keyer that creates the piano tone off of those main oscillators and then routes that tone over to here where it joins the bus that goes over to the left hand main channel. Now a lot of theater organs, especially the ones that ended up in pizza parlors where I got introduced to the theater organ, and this was certainly the case at Pizza and Pipes, had the traps and percussions out in the room. Uh, only the pipes were in the chamber. And, uh, you know, that was a, a sound I was used to. On a lot of bigger theater organs in actual theaters, uh, you would also have the percussions in a separate chamber with a separate expression pedal so that you could open that up and have them either expressed separately from the pipe voices or uh, you could, um, you know, uh, close them down and, and do all kinds of things with that. So I thought it might be fun to make the percussions as if they're exposed. Now the other percussion instruments, there's also uh, uh, what's labeled a harp, which is really closer to what we might call a cristaglot, which would be a metal bar marimba. Uh, and orchestral bells or, or glockenspiel. And the way those are generated on this organ is it's basically just combination of tibia pitches percussed. It doesn't generate that great a sound and you kind of you end up either tibia or percussion so it's not as all that useful. So those uh, the only really useful tuned percussion is the piano voice on this instrument so I'm really focusing on that. As for the uh, Christoglot and the Glockenspiel, um, these organs were sometimes equipped with a real uh, Glockenspiel and I have one of those and I'm that's going to be a future project where I hook that up to this instrument to take the place of. As far as the harp is concerned I'm not sure what I'm going to do with that. For now it's just not going to get used because it's eh, not all that useful. So what's going to happen here is similar to what I did with the string stops. This right here is the resistor that carries all the traps, the you know snare drum, tambourine, bass drum, all that stuff, into the bus. And so just like on the solitional, I've pulled the output side out and I've attached one end of an audio cable right here. And then we're going to carry that on the other side is where we tap the piano output and that goes into this same gray audio cable that's going to loop around over to a position near our output panel and because we're going to be bypassing the preamp circuits in the output panel what I'm going to do is insert this preamp circuit now this came from a project I did years and years ago uh, back when I was in college and uh, my grandfather had the idea of wanting to really expand the capabilities of the pipe organ we had in his house and uh, I you know hit upon the idea of why don't we put in some electronics to do read stops um, that organ had a flute, a diapason, and two strings. Uh, it would have been nice to have a second flute and, and some reed stops. So to get that, we were going to do it electronically with a company called Devtronics. And I've shown you some Devtronics before, uh, looking at this older technology. They built kits to build your own electronic organ. So I started doing some of that. Um, and I got a lot of that stuff together, but then Grandpa was really toward the end of his life and he got sick and so we had to put that project on hold and it never really got done. But I kept all the stuff. So we're going to insert this preamp, which was designed for the Devtronic stuff. 
Um, it requires 15 volts plus and minus to run it. It has two inputs, so we can have our traps on one side and our piano on the other, and this should take the place. Now, of course, in addition to bypassing the preamp circuit, we're also bypassing the expression. So this will function as if those instruments are outside of the chamber. So let me rearrange the camera and we'll take a look at how we're going to do this. So this is the other side of the board I was showing you before. Um, here's the wire coming in from the traps. This is the audio cable from the piano keyer output that comes off of a different panel and I've tied into it so I have this piece of audio cable that's for two channels this is our shielded cable hooked to ground um, like I said this is off of that resistor that contains the traps and then here is the piano itself and so this cable has been tied in with some zip ties and goes over where we're going to mount the uh, preamp circuit uh, next to our output panel. Okay, so we're down in the in the guts of the organ here. This of course is the out, main output panel. It has all the sockets for the different audio channels coming out. And this is our new preamp circuit and we're going to mount it right here. There's a nice open space here. I've got some offset uh, little pieces and some screws to mount this with. Um, I've pre-wired ahead of time before shooting the video. Uh, this is off of the power supply. Now I don't have 15 volts plus and minus. I've got 15 volt minus but not 15 volt plus. Well, this circuit should work okay on 12 volts plus and minus. The key is that it needs that plus and minus uh, to operate. So I've tied into the power supply here where we have our ground, 12 volts plus, 12 volts minus, and that is represented here by green, red, and black, which is, of course, ground. Red is 12 volts plus, black is 12 volts minus. Now when we talk about uh, voltage sources that are plus and minus, um, ground is not really negative, it's more a neutral position, which is very similar to how alternating current is brought into your house. So it also kind of illustrates why birds don't die when they land on high voltage lines. Uh, and why you wouldn't die either if you were hanging from one. Uh, electricity is actually the differential in potential. So the fact is, if my feet are at a million volts, and I grab a wire that's at a million volts, the same polarity, you know, say it's a million volts plus on my feet, and I grab a million volts plus in my hand, there's no difference of potential. So there is no electricity, nothing is happening. And so when a bird lands on a high voltage wire, boom, there's nothing happening because there's no difference in between the wire and the air. Now the reason that's not a good thing for us land dwellers is because the American electrical grid is a grounded system. The earth is the neutral position. And so that's why you have a big grounding rod at, at your home and your water pipes are connected in and all of that. There is definitely a difference in potential between that high voltage line and the ground. And so if you reach up and grab one, yeah, you're toast. Uh, so when we're looking at our voltage differential, the differential between 12 volts plus and 12 volts minus is, of course, 24 volts but we have our neutral position in between. So when you measure from ground to either of these, you only get 12 volts. So in fact, we're actually running this on 24 volts, but it's 24 volts with the center tap. In the case of an amplifier circuit, that's so that we can run complete waveforms through the amplifier. 
So when we look at a waveform off of an audio signal, we're, it's technically an alternating current signal. You're going high and you're going low. The center is that neutral point. And in order to amplify that, we have to have plus and minus voltage source to be able to do that. So any piece of equipment that is going to produce any kind of audio has to have a power supply with a center point neutral and plus and minus voltages. Uh, this is achieved very simply. If you study power supply circuits, you have a transformer with a center tap and that center becomes your ground or neutral position. So uh, the other thing is, of course, our audio signal. And we saw the other end of this cable. I've, as I said, I've already uh, run it around and I've pre-stripped and soldered on this. So this rest of this should go pretty clear. Uh, the audio signals come in here. Our power comes in here. So let's get this thing mounted and then we'll hook it up and we'll kind of try to test things as we go. This could be a complete disaster um, because uh, there might be some little detail I have not foreseen. Um, I've, of course, read the schematic as clearly as I could and as carefully as I could to find the actual points where I could tap into the audio. I'm 99 and 9 tenths percent sure I did that correctly, but that's why I do not do these as how-to videos. These are strictly for your own entertainment to see what I'm doing and uh, the standard disclaimer is don't try this at home. Okay, so at this point, I've connected up the power to our new little preamp circuit. And we're going to turn the organ on and see if we let any smoke out. That's the old corny joke, of course, is that electronic components work off of smoke. And when you let the smoke out, they don't work anymore. So at any rate, um, before I connect up the audio, um, and plug the organ all back in so we can hear something, uh, we're going to check that out first. Okay, so organ's on. Our power feed is connected. I don't feel anything getting hot or nothing's exploding. <laughs> So far, so good. So now, next thing will be uh, hook up the audio, and then we'll turn the organ around and get it all connected up and uh, see if we get anything.
Okay, so our audio connection is made, our power connection is made, our new preamp is mounted. So all that's left to do is plug an audio cord in here into the sound system, see what happens. Okay, so we've turned the organ around. Uh, we've got uh, everything plugged in and we've got partial success here. Uh, the piano. It is working through the new preamp, but the thing is I had to turn that preamp input down all the way to keep it from going into just full-out distortion. So that's a good indication that there's an impedance mismatch between the output signal coming off of the piano keyer and the input of that little Devtronics preamp. There's a couple ways to address that. It may be as simple as just inserting a big resistor. Um, that's, that's the easy way. That could produce satisfactory results. But I may need to put in an impedance matching circuit. Uh, and so that would be an interesting video too. I can show you how to make one of those. Um, basically it's a potentiometer and it's similar to a volume control except that it's uh, more that it is uh, sending signal to ground rather than just inserting resistance. The traps on the other hand those are turned all the way up and I have the traps forte stop on just to get anything at all out of it. So um, that could be as simple as on that output resistor, put in a smaller resistor. I had to do that on some of the other circuits, the output resistor uh, going from the filter circuit to the bus. Uh, on several stops, I put in smaller resistors uh, so that I could get the stops to balance out correctly. Um, it's, yeah, that's obviously not a very difficult thing to do. But that apparently is going to be our next video, is making the, the trap circuits all work correctly uh, with the piano. And then I want to show you this. The other thing I'm going to do, which will kind of be fun, and I've used these on a number of instruments I've owned. Uh, this is a pitch shifter. And the way, it's, it'll do a bunch of things, but the way I usually set it up is we've got a mono input and then a stereo output. Now of course that piano traps circuit is a mono output and if we run it through here then we get a stereo output and then I can put the signal in both sides of the audio and I can shift the pitch on one side and then this gives us a natural chorus effect and that always serves to make electronic sounds a little more musical so, um, let's see, we're going to try and match the impedance better for the piano. We're going to get the, the trap circuit a little bit of a boost. So we get a little more signal out of that, and we're going to insert a pitch shifter. So we can look forward to that next time. Thanks for joining me today, and we'll talk to you next time.